So I'm going to read from uh, this book. It's called Games of the North American Indians by Stuart Kulin. So I'm in the introduction of this book. And it says here, the games of the American Indians may be divided into two general classes. First, games of chance. And second, games of dexterity. Games of pure skill and calculation, such as chess, are entirely absent. The Indian games of chance fall into two categories one games in which implements of the nature of dice are thrown at random to determine a number of nu or numbers and the sum of the counts is kept by means of sticks pebbles etc or upon an abacus or counting board or circuit two games in which one or more of the players guess in which of the two or more places an odd or particularly marked lot is concealed success or failure resulting in the gain or loss of counters the games of dexterity may be enumerated as one archery and various modifications two a game of sliding javelins or darts upon the hard ground or ice all right ice there we go that's where we get the hockey from all right a game of shooting at a moving target consistent of a netted wheel or a ring or a netted wheel or a netted what ring a ring a round ring and a net. Four, the game of ball in several highly specialized forms. Ball games. All right. In many different forms. Five, the racing games. More or less related to and complicated with the ball games. In addition, there is a subclass related to the games of shooting at a moving target. 
at which it is a miniature and solitaire form corresponding to the European game of cup and ball. Games of all classes this designated are found among all the Indian tribes of North America. All right, all of them had games and constitute the games par excellence of the Indians. Children have a variety of other amusements, such as top spinning. All right, tops. I don't know if you guys ever played throwing the tops on the floor. We do that a lot where I'm from in Costa Rica. Uh, mimic fights and similar imitative sports. But the games first described are played only by men and women or youth and maidens, not by children. And usually at fixed seasons as the accompaniment of certain festivals or religious rites. There is no evidence that any of the games described were imported into America at any time, either before or after the conquest. On the other hand, they appear to be the direct national outgrowth of Aboriginal institutions in America. All right. Very important. So don't say that they learned this from other people, foreigners, Europeans come in here and teaching them. No, they this is something they created here in America, the Aboriginal people. They show no modifications due to white influence other than the decay which characterizes all Indian institutions under existing conditions. And we know nowadays to not just think of what Europeans as white, but as European influence, not just white like a people, a complexion. Because we know that they, there was many hundreds of thousands of black Europeans that got sent over here during colonial times in every form, in every way as colonists, conquistadors, indentured servants, convicts, prisoners of war, etc. Just like the pale skin European as well in all those forms. All right. So again, didn't mean to get off subject here, but very important. You know, when they say white influence, they mean European influence outside anybody coming in. It is probable, however, that the wide dissemination of certain games, for example, the hand game is of comparatively recent date due to wider and less restricted intercourse through the abolition of tribal wars, playing cards and probably the simple board game called by the English Nine Men's Morris are among the few games borrowed by the Indians from the Europeans, not whites, Europeans. On the other hand, we have taken their lacrosse in the north and racket in the south. All right, lacrosse, racket, and the Mexicans on the Rio Grande play all the old Indian games under the Spanish names. You hear that? They switched it up. They took the names and they created their own names for these sports. But these were Indian games that they were playing and now under the Spaniard names. Continuous as references to games are of common occurrence in the origin myths of various tribes. They usually consist of description of a series of contests in which the demiurge, the, the first man, the culture hero overcomes some opponent and foe of the human race by exercise of superior cunning skill or magic. So imagine that, right? Always in these myth creation stories, they're playing some kind of sport or the guy, the hero, or all these people are showing some kind of skills or magic or superior powers. Comparison of these myths not only reveal their practical unity, but disclose the primal gamblers as those curious children, the divine twins, the miraculous offspring of the sun, who are the principal personages in many Indian mythologies. They live in the east and in the west. They rule night, day, winter, and summer. They are the morning and evening stars. Their virgin mother, who appears also as their sister and their wife, is constantly spoken of as their grandmother, and is the moon or the earth, the spider woman, the embodiment of the feminine, principle in nature, always contending, they are the original patrons of play, and their games are the games now played by men, alright, so remember, this could almost mean like also like deities, right or like how the Greeks symbolize, right the Atlanteans and, and, and Mount Olympia, these gods playing sports and games, well now, and all of a sudden it started being played by men, just like they're saying here the significant emblems of the twins are their weapons. These consist of throwing club made of heavy wood, their bows and cane arrows, the bows interchangeable with a lance, and a netted shield. These objects are distinguished one from the other 
by the Americans, which again are commonly foretold, one pair referring to one of the twins and one to the other. In this fourfold division, we find included those other interrelated twins of whom mention has been made. Game and implements are almost exclusively derived from these symbolic weapons. Are you hear that? For example, the stick dice are either arrow, shaft, or miniature bows. All right, and similar origin may be asserted for the implements used in the hand game and in the four stick game, counting sticks in general, and sticks for the stick game are arrows. The engraved and painted tubes used in the guessing game are arrows shaftments. In the games of dexterity, we find again bows and arrows, and the netted shield with bows. Snow snakes are either the club, the bows, or arrows. Ball seems to be less sure, but the racket may be referred to the net shield. The painted sticks of the kicked the billet race are miniature bows. The opposing players are frequently the representatives of the two war gods. We find game and implements as things pleasing to the gods among the objects sacrificed upon the altar of the twins in Sunyi. So I see how they're letting you know how that story of the twins and what they're using in that myth and the implements, the bow and arrow, how significant it is in creating and helping establish uh, these games and the use of sticks and all that and where they get the origin from. Because a lot of these ancient uh, so-called, you know, uh, civilizations, they'll tell you, oh yeah, they had these sports, but they will never tell you how they created this, where did they come up with these, uh, you know, the, the concept of a ball or, or how to, why you're shooting or kicking the ball in the net, you know what I mean? So, you know, when you, you read the origins of everything here on this side of the world especially you know you see that there are a lot of the times they have the origin myth story to it there's not it didn't it didn't just it did not just come out of nowhere there's an origin to it so we return to the book games of the north american indians i'm on page 561 and we're going to get into what this book has to say about all oh, the ball games here of the north american indians from what they've researched in this book. And it says here, under the general name of ball, I have classed all ball games, howsoever played, and all games in which an implement and analogous to a ball is employed. And none of them, with trifling exceptions, which belong to distinct classes, is the ball ever touched with the hand. To do so, being strictly forbidden by the rules of the game, all right, so very important. A lot of these ball games, you didn't use the hand. All right, the Indian ball games may be classified as follows first, racket, in which the ball is tossed with a racket, second, shiny, in which the ball is struck with a club or bat. All right, sounds like baseball, right? Shiny, third, double ball, a game chiefly confined to women. Played with two balls or billets tied together. Tossed with a stick. Fourth, the ball race. In which a ball or stick is kicked. All right, a ball is what? Kicked, right? Soccer. Or with a stick, like field hockey. In addition, subsidiary to the preceding and not general, being confined to a few tribes, we have fifth, football. Six, hand and football. Seventh, toss ball. Eighth, juggling. And ninth, hot ball. All right, so when they mean football, they really mean using your foot. All right, because then they also have the hand and foot ball, so you can use your hands. Games of the first three classes are widespread and almost universal. The ball race appears to be confined to the Southwest. The balls used vary greatly in material. The commonest form is covered with buckskin, but other balls are made of wood, of bladder netted with sinew, and a cordage, bone, or stone. It says here, racket. The game of ball with rackets is distinctly a man's game as opposed to shiny and double ball, which are commonly played by women. All right, so you see Chinese was something like hitting a ball with a bat. This was played by women. It is, however, sometimes played by women and in one instance by men and women together. The Santi. All right, Sue. 
Racket is less widely distributed than Shiny, being confined to the Algonquin and Iroquoian tribes of the Atlantic seaboard and the region of the Great Lakes, and to their neighbors, the Dakota on the west and the Muscogean tribes of the south. It occurs again among the Chinook and the Salish in the northwest, in a limited area in California. It is not recorded in the southwest. And it says here, figure 748, this is a miniature racket used by conjurers to look into futurity. Conjurers, length eight and a half inches, Mississauga Indians, right? It's in Canada, Ontario. The game may be divided into two principal classes. First, those in which a single racket or a bat is used. Second, those in which two rackets are employed. The latter is peculiar to the southern tribes, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Muscogee, Seminole, among whom the single racket is not recorded. The racket may be regarded as a practical contrivance akin to the throwing stick, but its origin is not clear. Morgan relates that the present netted bat of the Seneca was preceded by a simple stick with a curved end and Tide tells how bark strings were used by the Thompson Indians and in bending ball sticks to the required crook. The strings which were sometimes left attached to the bat furnish an explanation of the present net. On the other hand, it is not unlikely that the racket may be related with the drum hoop to the spiderweb shield of the twin war gods, the probable source of the netted wheel. Reverend Peter Jones figures a miniature racquetball, and that's what we just saw, in the United States National Museum as used by conjurers to look into futurity. The ball used with the racket was either of wood, the Chippewa, the Pomo, the Santi, and Winnebago, or of buckskin stuffed with hair. The wooden ball appears to be the older and possibly the original form. Morgan states that the Seneca formerly used a solid ball of knot for which the deerskin ball was substituted. Of the two types of covered ball, the bag-shaped form is more commonly used in racket than that with a median seam. The goals were commonly two sets of posts or poles erected at the extremities of the fields. All right, so goals at each end between which the ball had to be driven. Single posts were sometimes used by the Miami, Mississauga, the Chippewa, and Minnesota, and Chinook. An early account of the Muscogee describes them as setting up a square mat as a target in their ball play. An analogous object is found in the plat of the racket game at New Orleans. Among the Choctaw, the goals were connected by a pole at the top. The length of the field appears to have varied greatly from 30 rods, the Mohawk, to have a league, the Miami. In general, it was remarkable for its extreme length. Attention appears to have been paid to the direction of the course, which is recorded as laid out from east to west or from north to south by the Santi. The season varied in different localities, summer among the Cherokee and winter and spring among the Santi Dakota. Racket was commonly a tribal or intertribal contest. Its object, apart from mere diversion, appears to have been the stakes which were invariably wagered. Among the Huron, however, lacrosse is recorded by the Jesuit missionaries as played as a remedy for sickness. All right, you hear that? You're feeling down and sick? Try out some lacrosse. The magical rites connected with the game, the dance, scarifications, going to water, taboos, amulets, and special features of the costume all appear to refer to success in the contents. Attention may be called to the parallel between the Cherokee myth of ball play of the birds and animals and that of the Mokasin game between the day and night animals recorded by the Dr. Washington Matthews. There can be no doubt, though, the game of racket may have been modified in historic times. 
it remains an aboriginal invention all right racquetball lacrosse and all this what is it it's an aboriginal invention this was not brought over here by europeans it was not brought over here in ancient times by any other people like romans or anything like that because when you again try to research the history of these things they always try to tell you it originated on the other side of the world but this is an aboriginal invention aboriginals from america and it says here the algonquin stock Cheyenne in colorado professor f v hayden gives the following description ohoniwo o a ball club with a hoop at the end to hold the ball as it is thrown continuing chippewa Fort Michili Mackinac, Michigan. Alexander Henry says, Bagatiwe, called by the Canadians Le Jeu de la Croce, is played with a bat and a ball. The bat is about four feet in length, curved, and terminating in a sort of racket. Two posts are planted in the ground at a considerable distance from each other, as a mile or more. Each party has its post, and the game consists in throwing the ball up to the post of the adversary. The ball at the beginning is placed in the middle of the course and each party endeavors as well to throw the ball out of the direction of its own post as into that of the adversaries. Henry describes a game of ball played by the Ojibwa, Chippewa, and Sockies, the Sock, on the King's birthday, June 4th, 1763, at Fort Michili Ma Kinak, through which by strategy that fort was taken it says here Michigan Baraga gives the following definitions plain ball or play ball pick walk what meaning primarily not on a tree ball play pagado we wing pagado wanak Indian cross here to play with Jay Long says plain at ball, which is a favorite game, is very fatiguing. The ball is about the size of a cricket ball, made of deer skin and stuffed with hair. This is driven forwards and backwards with short sticks about two feet long and brought at the end like a bat, worked like a racket, but with larger interstices. By this, the ball is impelled and from the elasticity of the racket, which is composed of deer's Sl Slinu is thrown to a great distance. The game is played by two parties and the contest lies in intercepting each other and striking the ball into a goal at a distance of about 400 yards, at the extremity of which are played two high poles about the width of a wicket from each other. The victory consists in, a, in driving the ball between the poles. The Indians play with great good humor and even when one of them happens in the heat of the game to strike another with his stick, it is not resented. But these accidents are cautiously avoided, as the violence with which they strike has been known to break an arm or a leg. White Earth Agency, Minnesota. Dr. Walter J. Hoffman describes the ball play at this place where he says with a population of about 2,000 Indians, it is easy to muster from 80 to 100 ball players who are divided into sides of equal number. All right. If the condition of the ground permits, the two posts or goals are planted about one third of a mile apart. The best players of either side gather at the center of the ground. The poorer players arrange themselves around their respective goals, while the heaviest in weight scatter across the field between the starting point and the goals. The ball is tossed into the air in the center of the field. As soon as it descends, it is caught with the ball stick by one of the players when he immediately sets out at full speed towards the opposite goal. If too closely pursued or if intercepted by an opponent, he throws the ball in the direction of one of his own side who takes up the race. The usual method of depriving the player of the ball is to strike the handle of the ball stick so as to dislodge the ball. But this is frequently a difficult matter on account of a peculiar horizontal motion of the ball stick maintained by the runner. 
Frequently, the ball carrier is disabled by being struck across the arm or leg, thus compelling his retirement. Severe injuries occur only when playing for high stakes or when ill feelings exist between some of the players. Hmm. Should the ball carrier of one side reach the opposite goal, it is necessary for him to throw the ball so that it touches the post. This is always a difficult matter because even if the ball be well directed, one of the numerous players surrounding the post as guards may intercept it and throw it back into the field. In this manner, a single inning may be continued for an hour or more. The game may come to a close at the end of an inning by mutual agreement of the players, that side winning the greater number of scores being declared victor. The ball used in this game is made by wrapping thin strands of buckskin and covering the hole with a piece of the same. It is about the size of a baseball, though not so heavy. The stick is of the same pattern as that used by the beginning of the present century by the Mississaugas, the Ojiwa of the Eagle Totem of the province of Ontario. All right, it's showing you another racket. And this is an example of the Chippewa Indians racket uh, stick in that. It says here, Chippewa, Bear Island, Leech Lake, Minnesota. This is from the American Museum of Natural History. Made of a sampling of 26 inches in length, curved at the striking end to form a hoop, netted with a buckskin thongs collected by Dr. William Jones in 1903. And then it shows another figure here. This one looks more like the lacrosse one, right? It says Wisconsin. Free Museum of Science and Art, University of Pennsylvania. This is figure 750, this one right here. says a racket, a sapling cut and curved to form an oval hoop at the striking end, lashed at the end and crossed by two thongs, which are interwined but not knotted in the middle. Length is 34 inches and collected by Mr. T.R. Rohde. Continuing, says Chippewa, Wisconsin, Jonathan Carver says, they amuse themselves at several sorts of games, but the principal and most esteemed among them is that of a ball, which is not unlike the European game of tennis. The balls they use are rather larger than those made use of it at a tennis and are formed of a piece of deerskin, which being moistened to render it supple, it's stuffed hard with the hair of the same creature and sued with its sinews. The ball sticks are about three feet long, at the end of which are there is fixed a kind of racket, resembling the palm of the hand and fashioned by thongs cut from a deerskin. And these they catch the ball and throw it a great distance. If they are not prevented by some of the opposite party who try to intercept it, the game is generally played by large companies that sometimes consist of more than 300 and it is not uncommon for different bands to play against each other. 300 players? Do you hear that? They begin by fixing two poles in the ground at about 600 yards apart. And one of these goals belongs to each party of the combat combatants. The ball is thrown up high in the center of the ground and in a direct line between the goals towards which each party endeavors to strike it and which soever side first causes it to reach their own goal reckons towards the game they are so exceeding dexterous in this manly exercise that the ball is usually kept flying in different directions by the force of the rackets without touching the ground during the whole contention for they are not allowed to catch it with their hands they run with amazing velocity in pursuit of each other and when one is on the point of hurling it to a great distance, an antagonist overtakes him and by a sudden stroke dashes down the ball. They play with so much vehemence that they frequently wound each other and sometimes a bone is broken. But notwithstanding these accidents, there never appears to be any spite or wanton exertions of strength to affect them, nor do any disputes ever happen between the parties. Continuing, in his Chippewa vocabulary, he gives ball as a lewin. Apostle Islands, Wisconsin, J.G. Cole says, Of all the Indian social sports, 
the finest and grandest is the ball play. I might call it a noble game. And I am surprised how these savages attain such a perfection in it. So he's calling these people savages, but then he's like, but how do they perfect such an ill game? These ain't savages. Nowhere in the world, excepting perhaps among the English and some of the Italian races, is the graceful and manly game of the ball played so passionately and on so large a scale, so large a scale. They often play village against village or tribe against tribe. Hundreds of players assemble and the worries and goods offered as prices often reach a value of a thousand dollars and more. Wow. On our island, we made a vain attempt to get up a game, for though the chiefs were ready enough, and all were cut in their rackets and balls in the bushes, the chief American authorities forbade this innocent amusement. Hence, on this occasion, I was only enabled to inspect the instruments. They were made with great care and well adapted for the purpose, and it is to be desired that the Indians would display the same attention to more important matters. The rackets are two and a half feet in length, carved very gracefully out of a white tough wood and provided with a handle. The upper end is formed into a ring, four or five inches in diameter, worked very firmly and regularly and covered by a network of leather bands. The balls are made of white willow and cut perfectly round with the hand. Crosses, stars and circles are carved upon them the care devoted to the ball is sufficient to show how highly they estimate the game. The French call it jeu de cross. Great ball players who can send the ball so high that it is out of sight attain the same renown among the Indians as celebrated runners, hunters, or warriors. The name of the ball play is immortalized both in the geography and history of the country. There is a prairie and now a town on the Mississippi known as the Prairie de la Cross. Did you know that? It says here Chippewa, Wisconsin. Professor I. I. Ducatel described boys playing at ball by throwing it out and catching it with a stick, the end of which is curled up and makes the op opening a pocket of network. This is Pagatowanak. Fort William, Ontario, American Museum of Natural History. So I see a wooden ball, figure 751, painted red, three inches in diameter, perforated with a hole, which emits a whistling noise in the air, and a wooden racket, 36 inches long, curved at the striking end to form a hoop, which is netted with a buckskin thong. Collected in 1903, by Dr. William Jones, who gives the name of the ball as Pick Wak Wat We, and that of the racket and the game as Paga Towan. All right, this is a figure, it looked very similar like the rest of them. Very important said the ball had like this hole, so it made like a whistling noise while it was in the air. Very interesting. It says here, Delaware's Pennsylvania. In Saysburger's Indian Dictionary, we find the definition ball or kugel against sistat it says menomine wisconsin dr walter j hoffman describes the following game when anyone prepares to have a game of ball he selects the captains or leaders of the two sides who are to compete each leader then appoints his own players and the ball sticks to be used are deposited at the ball ground on the day before the game is to occur. Then each of the leaders selects a powerful and influential mita, whose services are solicited for taking charge of the safety of the ball sticks and to prevent their being charmed or conjured by the opposing mita. The mita is not expected to be present at the ground during the night because he is supposed to have the power to influence the sticks at any distance. Should one Mita succeed in obtaining such necromantic power over the sticks as to carry them away from the ground, that is, to carry away the power of the sticks, then it is the duty of the opposing Mita to follow him and bring them back. 
in case the pursuing Mita does not succeed in catching the rival, on account of being outwitted or because of having insufficient power in overcoming him, then the pursuing Mita is killed by his rival sorcery. It usually happens that the pursuer compels the rival to restore the virtue of power of the sticks before the day approaches. Four innings are played and usually the presents consistent of pieces of cloth are divided into four parts, one part being given to the victor of each inning. Sometimes, however, the presents are renewed until the end of the game. The frames from which the presents are suspended are near the middle of the ground, but off toward the eastern side, the tobacco tray and other accessories being placed on the ground between them and toward the center of the ball ground. The two horizontal parallel poles forming the upper part of the framework are used for the calico and blankets before them on the ground. A cloth is spread and on this are placed tobacco pipes and matches to which all the participants are at liberty to help themselves. The accompanying plate represents the players during a run for the ball. The latter is made of thongs of buckskin tightly wrapped and covered with buckskin or leather and measures about two and a half inches in diameter. The sticks, figure 752, says right here, this big black one, are made of hickory or ash and about three feet long. The wood being shaved thinner and bent into a hoop or ring at least four inches in diameter. Four or five thongs pass through the holes in the hoop and cross in the center forming a netted pocket in which the ball may rest half hidden. When the ball is caught, the runner carries the stick almost horizontally before him, moving it rapidly from side to side and at the same time turning the stick so as to keep the ball always in front and retained by the pocket. This constant swinging and twisting movement tends to prevent players of the opposite side from knocking the ball out or dislodging it by hitting the stick. The manner of the preparing for and playing the game is like that of the Ojibwa of northern Minnesota. During the intervals of rest, the players approach the place of the presence and smoke. The giver of the game also awards to the successful players a part of the presence, the whole quantity being divided into four portions, so that equal portions are distributed at each of the intervals. The players frequently hang to the belt the tail of a deer, an antelope, or some other fleet animal, or the wings of swift flying birds, with the idea that through these they are endowed with the swiftness of the animal. There are, however, no special preparations preceding a game as feasting or fasting, dancing, etc. Additional evidence that the game is not so highly regarded among the Ojibwa tribe. And uh, this is an example of what they're talking about. You know, dodge the hijack here. Just a little sketch here, but this is what they're trying to show as an example. All right. Continuing. So it's here, Miami, St. Joseph River, Michigan. Charlevoix says, referring to lacrosse, it is played with a ball and with two staffs recurved and terminated by a sort of racket. Two posts are set up which serve as bounds and which are distant from each other in proportion to the number of players. For instance, if there are 80 of these, there will be a half league between the posts. The players are divided into two bands, each having its own post and it is a question of driving the ball as far as the post of the opposing party without falling upon is the ground or being touched with the hand. If either of these happens, the game is lost, unless he who has committed the mistake repairs it by driving the ball with one stroke to the bound, which is often impossible. These savages are so adroit in catching the ball with their crosses that these games sometimes last several days in succession. All right, you hear that? Like, oh, the game ain't over. It ain't over. Where you going? We still playing. Salt de Saint Marie 
Michigan. Mr. Alexander McFarland Davis says, In 1667, Nicholas Perrin, then acting as an agent of the French government, was received near Saint Marie with stately courtesy and formal ceremony by the Miamis, to whom he was deputed. All right. So before we continue, we're getting, we're getting a lot of these uh, French people, right? Leaving these notes and visiting these areas. Uh, just remember who these French people are in these times. Most of these French people were people of color. A lot of them were Huguenots. Huguenots were ex Sephardi Jews and Moors. Crypto Muslims or crypto Jews who had become Protestants, you know, Presbyterians, Huguenots, all this stuff. All right. And they came over here and, you know, they were called French, but, you know, they were of a certain type of people, most of these French. A few days after his arrival, the chief of that nation gave him, as an entertainment, a game of lacrosse. More than 2,000 persons assembled in a great plain, each with his cross. A wooden ball about the size of a tennis ball was tossed in the air. From that moment, there was a constant movement of all these crosses which made a noise like that of arms, which one hears during a battle. Half of the savages tried to send the ball to the northwest of the length of the field. All right, dodge the hijack with this author calling people savages. The others wished to make it go to the southeast. The contest, which lasted for half hour, was doubtful. Mississauga, New Credit, Ontario. Reverend Peter Jones says, ball playing is another favorite amusement. Rice Lake, Ontario. G. Cobway says, one of the most popular games is that of a ball plane, which oftentimes engages an entire village. All right, the whole village is playing. Parties are formed of from 10 to several hundred, several hundred. The whole village is playing. Before they commence, those who are to take part in the play must provide each his share of stockings or things which are set apart and one leader for each party. Each leader appoints one of each company to be stake holder. Each man and each woman, women sometimes engage in the sport and armed with stick, one end of which bends somewhat like a small hoop, about four inches in circumference, to which is attached a net work of raw hide, two inches deep, just large enough to admit the ball, which is used on the occasion. Two poles are driven in the ground at a distance of 400 paces from each other, which serves as goals for the two parties. It is endeavor of each to take the ball to his hole. The party which carries the ball and strikes his pole wins the game. The warriors very scantily attired, young and brave, fantastically painted, and women decorated with feathers assembled around their commanders who are generally swift on the race. They are to take the ball either by running with it or throwing it in the air. As the ball falls in the crowd, the excitement begins. The clubs swing and roll from side to side. The players run and shout, fall upon the thread each other, and in the struggle, some get rather rough treatment. When the ball is thrown some distance on each side, the party standing near instantly pick it up and run at full speed with three or four after him at full speed. You hear that? The others send their shouts of encouragement to their own party. Ha, ha, ya, ha, ha, ya, ane guk. And these shouts are heard even from the distant lodges, from children, and all are deeply interested in the exciting scene. The spoils are not all on which their interest is fixed but is directed to the falling and rolling of the crowds over and under each other. The loud and merry shouts of the spectators who crowd the doors of the wigwams go forth and want a continued peal and testify to their happy state of feeling. The players are clothed in fur. All right, they got fur on. They receive blows whose marks are plainly visible after the scuffle. All right, you hear this? This is rough. Sounds like a little bit like football rugby, right? The hands and feet are unencumbered and they exercise them to the extent of their powers. And with such dexterity do they strike the ball that is, it is sent out of sight. 
another strikes it on its descent, and for 10 minutes at a time, the play is so adroitly managed that the ball does not touch the ground. Can you just imagine people hitting the ball with a bat, like in a baseball field? Like, just picture this. A bunch of bats, right? People trying to catch it with a bat, hitting it back and forth with a bat without it hitting the ground for 10 minutes. Like, you know? I don't think they could even do that today, anybody. Even these baseball players. What do you think, guys? No one is hurt to complain, though he be bruised severely, or his nose coming close communing with a club. If the last mentioned catastrophe befell him, he is up in a trice and sets his laugh forth as loud as the rest though it be floated at first on the tide of blood. It is very seldom, if ever, that one is seen to be angry because he has been hurt. If he, sh if he should get so, they would call him a coward, which proves a sufficient check to many evils, which might result from many seemingly intended injuries. So that was a very deep <laughs> paragraph I just, right there. So... If anybody got angry or got in their feelings, you hear what you hear what they're telling you? If any of these players got in their feelings just because they got hit, right? Because he got hurt. If he got in his feelings, he got angry. What they would call him? A coward. You're a coward. If you get all up in your feelings, you're a coward and angry because we're just playing a game. And we're just teaching about the ancient games of america nipissing 40 miles above montreal quebec j.a cool gives the following definitions all right and so this guy is speaking in uh, french all right but he's describing the game says here pasamaquoddy eastport maine united states national museum says here hide ball Figure 753 is this one right here. Made of a single piece with a thong drawstring at the edge. Forming a flattened spheroid. Diameter 3 and 1 fourth inches. Collected by Dr. Edward Palmer. Mr. James Mooney states that the pasa strong, closely woven netting, which enables the stick to be used for batting. The sticks are ornamented with death signs cut or burned into the wood and are sometimes further adorned with paint and feathers. Mrs. W. W. Brown describes the game as follows. Right? The pen is caught. E bes qua mo gan, or game of ball, seems to have been the most popular and universal of the outdoor games and played by all North American tribes. All right, all North American tribes. So the French didn't bring this over here. You feel me? Their legends are more or less indebted to it. Their legends are indebted to it. This was not brought by French. Tradition gives it a prominent place in their wonderful mythology. All right, it's part of the mythology. The Aurora Borealis is supposed to be Waba Banal, playing ball. Among the Wabanaki, it was played by women as well as men, but with few exceptions, never at the same time in place, as hunters and warriors played ball to gain muscular power, to stimulate their prowess, and to augment their fleetness of foot. You hear that? It wasn't just about playing games. They were training for war. It helped them gain muscular power to stimulate their prowess and the augment of their fleetness on foot. They got so good, all right, at playing these ball games. It helped them during times of war. It was part of training. It wasn't always just about playing games. The players formed in a circle proportionate to the number engaged in the game. Each held a stick called Ebes Kwa Mogang Atok. This was made of some flexible wood, about three feet in length, crooked to the three-fourth of a circle at one end, which was interwoven with stripes of hide after the manner of snowshoes. One man was detached to stand in the center, and on his throwing into the air a chip 
upon which he had spat. Cock, one would cry, I'll take the dry, or I'll take the wet, thus forming opposite factions. The side of the chip which fell uppermost decided which party would commence play. The ball was never touched with the hand, but thrown and kept in motion by the ebes qua mo gang atok. The goals were two rings or holes dug in the ground, the distance of the circle of players apart. The game consisted in getting the ball into opponent's goal, and regard for neither life nor limb was allowed to stand in the way of possible success as they played with little or nothing on. Few escaped unhurt. All right, you hear that? Doesn't matter, no gear. Ain't no protective gear here. And if you uh, get angry because you get hurt, what happened? You'd be considered a coward. But these mishaps were taken as the fortunes of war and no resentment was felt. The women dressed very scantily while playing this game and the men having a strict code of honor never go near their playground. You see that? So the women wore less clothes or that's what they're saying or maybe they looked a certain way that they usually... And you know, for Indians, they're not about showing their skin like that. So they even the men were like, nah, let's not go watch them. They're half naked over there. <laughs> One tradition tells of a man that did so and threw shells and pebbles at the players. They screened themselves as best they could behind bushes and rocks. At the second attack, however, they made a rush in the direction from which the missiles came. The man ran to the water and plunging in was turned into a chepen o quiz, a large cluffage, by which transformation they knew he was a mohawk. They look upon all mohawks as addicted to sorcery. Hey, I didn't say it. <laughs> Penoscop, Old Town, Maine. Peabody Museum, American Archaeology and Ethnology. Ball for lacrosse. Figure 755, four inches in diameter, covered with buckskin and filled with moose hair. They're talking about this one right here. All right, 755, that's the ball, the racket. The cover, a nearly circular piece of buckskin about nine inches in diameter, is drawn up with a buckskin thong puddling back fashion around the wad of a moose hair. Over it is placed a second piece of buckskin five inches in diameter, which closes the opening. It was purchased from Big Thunder, one of the very old men of the tribe, when he was on a visit to Cambridge. Sock and Foxes, Iowa, American Museum of Natural History. It says here, Racket. So 756 is this one right here. All right. Made of hard wood, with the ends shaved thin and turned around to form a circular hoop, which is laced with cord passing through the edge. Length 29 and a half inches. Collected by Dr. William Jones in 1901. Buckskin covered ball. Figure 757, two and, two and three fourths inches in diameter. Back shaped with thong attached at the end of the seam. Collected in 1901 by Dr. William Jones, who describes it as a lacrosse ball. A bundle of 20 pieces of reed. Nine and a half inches in length in the same collection is described as message sticks for the lacrosse game. All right, so they're talking about this right here message sticks, all right? The balls and the lacrosse stick. Tama, Iowa, the Tama, Tamari Free Museum of Science and Art, University of Pennsylvania. Hickory sticks, which the end turned over to form a small hoop, which is netted with thong length. 50 and a half inches collected by the writer in 1900 these indians stated that they no longer make their own balls the ball game they call bagahatuwitni and the stick or chi dr william jones informed me that the ball pegwaki used this game was back shaped and drawn up with a thong sock and foxes in oklahoma american museum of natural history Racket made of 
hickory with the end cut thin and turned around to form an oval hoop as shown in figure 760 length 42 inches the circumference is perforated with five holes through which thongs pass to form a network as illustrated in the figure collected by dr william jones the shawnee indian territory dr william jones informs me that the lacrosse game while usually played by men alone, it's played also by men and women on opposite sides. The men using the stakes and the women their hands. In this latter case, the goals, hoop wickets, are nearer together than when men play alone. Chinookan stock. Chinook. Fort Vancouver, Washington. Paul Kane says, They also take great delight in a game with a ball which is played by them in the same manner as the Cree, Chippewa, and Sioux Indians. Two poles are erected about a mile apart, and the company is divided into two bands, armed with sticks having a small ring or hoop at the end with which the ball is picked up and thrown to a great distance. Each party then strives to get the ball past their own goal. There are sometimes a hundred on a side, and the play is kept up with great noise and excitement. At this game, they bet heavily as it is generally played between tribes and villages. All right. What happens? They bet. Bet. They betting just like they bet on sports today. A rock wind stock. Kanawaga, Quebec. Colonel James Smith thus describes the game. They used a wooden ball about three inches in diameter. In the instrument, they moved it with was a strong staff about five feet long with a hoop net on the end of it, large enough to contain the ball. Before they begin to play, they lay off about half a mile distance in a clear plain, and the opposite parties all attend at the center, where a disinterested person cast up the ball. Then the opposite parties all contend for it. If anyone gets it into his net, he runs with it the way he wishes it to go, and they all pursue him. If one of the opposite party overtakes the person with the ball, he gives the stay a stroke, which causes the ball to fly out of the net. Then they have another debate for it. And if the one that gets it can outrun all the opposite party and can carry it quite out or over the line at the end, the game is won. But this seldom happens. When anyone is running away with the ball and is like to be overtaken, he commonly throws it. And with this instrument, can cast it to 50 or 60 yards all right so it sounds like when you know when and when you're running rugby like you gotta pass it right and they come at you but it also sounds like kill the man with the ball right so imagine like hundreds of people chasing you're like ah and you just throw it pass it to your your you know your teammate sometimes when the ball is almost at the one end matters will take a sudden turn and the opposite party may quickly carry it out the other end Oftentimes, they will work a long time back and forward before they can get the ball over the line or win the game. Cherokee, Tennessee River, North Carolina. John Bartram describes a ball dance in the council house at the Indian town of Kowee. This assembly was held principally to rehearse the ball play dance, this town being challenged to play against another the next day. The people being assembled and seated in order, and the musicians having taken their station, the ball opens first with a long harangue or oration spoken by an aged chief, a commendation of the manly exercise of the ball play, recounting the many and brilliant victories which the town of Kowee had gained over the other towns in the nation, not forgetting or neglecting to recite his own exploits together with those of other aged men now present coadjutors in the performance of these athletic games in their youthful days. This oration was delivered with great spirit and eloquence and was meant to influence the passions of the young men present, excite them to emulation, and inspire them with ambition. This prologue being at the end, the musicians began both vocal and instrumental, when presently a company of girls, hand in hand, dressed in clean white robes and ornamented with beads, 
bracelets and a profusion of gay ribbons entering the door immediately began to sing their responses in a gentle low and sweet voice and formed themselves in a semicircular file or line in two ranks back to back facing the spectators and musicians moving slowly round and round this continued about a quarter of an hour when we were surprised by a sudden very loud and shrill whoop uttered at once by a company of young fellows who came in briskly after one another with rackets or hurls in one hand man it just reminds me of like you know when you're about to watch football any sporting event and it's like it's you know whether it's high school college or wherever you know when the team comes in all amped up yeah that's what it sounds like I mean, you see these young men ready to go to battle ready to go play the game these champions likewise were well dressed painted and ornamented with silver bracelets gorgets and wampum neatly ornamented with moccasins and high waving plumes in their diadems they immediately formed themselves in a semicircular rank also in front of the girls when these changed their order and formed a single rank parallel to the men raising their voices and responses to the tunes of the young champions the semicircles continually moving around there was something singular and diverting in their step and motions and i imagine not to be learned to exactness but with great attention and perseverance the step if it can be so termed was performed after the following manner example first the motion began at one end of the semicircle generally rising up and down upon their toes and heels alternatively when the first was up on tiptoe the next began to raise the heel and by the time the first rested again on the heel the second was on tiptoe thus from one end of the rank to the other so that some were always up and some down alternately and regularly without the least bulk or confusion and they at the same time and in the same motion moved on obliquely or sideways so that the circle performed a double or complex motion in its progression and at stated times exhibited a grand or universal movement instantly and unexpectedly to the spectators by each rank turning to right and left taking each other's places the movements were managed with inconceivable alertness and address and accompanied with the instantaneous and universal elevation of the voice and shrill short whoop all right you heard that how they were just doing like this performance dance movement and creating these patterns and all that this is amazing cherokee north carolina mr james mooney describes the ball game of the east cherokee under the name of anetsa the ball now used in an ordinary leather covered ball but in former days it was made of deer hair and covered with deer skin in california the ball is of wood the ball sticks vary considerably among different tribes as before stated the cherokee player uses a pair catching the ball between them and throwing it in the same way the stick is somewhat less than three feet in length and its general appearance closely resembles a tennis racket or a long wooden spoon the ball of which is loose network of thongs of twisted squirrel skin or strings of indian hemp the frame is made of a slender hickory stick bent upon itself and so trimmed and fashioned that the handle seems to be of one solid round piece when in fact it is double the ball season begins about the middle of summer and lasts until the weather is too cold to permit exposure of the naked body for the players are always stripped for the game the favorite time is in the fall after the corn has ripened for then the indian has abundant leisure and at this season a game takes place somewhere on the reservation at least every other week while several parties are always in training the training consists chiefly in regular athletic practice the players of one side coming together with their ball sticks at some convenient spot of level bottom land where they strip to the waist divide into parties and run tumble and toss the ball until the sun goes down in addition to the athletic training which begins two or three weeks before the regular game each player is put under a strict gatunta or taboo all right training for three weeks you hear that 
during the same period, he must not eat the flesh of a rabbit, of which the Indians generally are very fond, because the rabbit is a timid animal, easily alarmed and liable to lose its wits when pursued by the hunter. Hence, the ball player must abstain from it, lest he too should become disconcerted and lose courage in the game. He must also avoid the meat of the frog, another item on the Indian bill of fare, because the frog's bones are brittle and easily broken, and a player who should partake of the animal would expect to be crippled in the first inning. For a similar reason, he abstains from eating the young of any bird or animal, and from touching an infant. He must not eat the fish called the hog sucker, because it is sluggish in its movements. He must not eat the herb called atunka or lamb's quarter, Xenopodium album, which the Indians use for greens because its stalk is easily broken. Hot food and salt are also forbidden, as in the medical gatunka. The taboo always lasts for seven days preceding the game, but in most cases it's enforced for 28 days. Example, four times seven. And it shows this as an example. And it says, and seven being sacred numbers, four and seven being sacred numbers. Above all, that he must not touch a woman. And the player who should violate this regulation should expose himself to the summary vengeance of his fellows. This last taboo continues also for seven days after the game. As before stated, if a woman even so much as touches a ball stick on the eve of a game, it is thereby rendered unfit for use as the white man's law is now paramount extreme measures are seldom resorted to but in former days the punishment for an infraction of this regulation was severe and in some tribes the penalty was death should a player's wife be with child he is not allowed to take part in the game under any circumstances as he is then believed to be heavy and sluggish in his movements having lost just so much as his strength and has gone into the child. All right, so you hear all this taboo behind their games right here, the, these people. Eastern Cherokee. At frequent intervals during the training period, the shaman takes the players to water and performs his mystic rites, as will be explained further on. They are also scratched on their naked bodies, as at the final game. But now the scratching is done in, in a half a third fashion with a piece of bamboo rear having stout thorns which leave broad gashes on the backs of the victims. When a player fears a particular contestant on the other side, as in frequently the case, his own shaman performs a special incantation intended to compass the defeat and even the disabling or death of his rival. As the Contending sides always belong to different settlements. Each party makes all these preliminary arrangements without the knowledge of the other and under the guidance of, of its own shamans, several of whom are employed on its side in every hotly contested game. All right, you hear that? So they even got their shamans on the sideline, helping them out. On the night preceding the game, each party holds the ball play dance in its own settlement. On the reservation, the dance is always held on Friday night so that the game may take place on Saturday afternoon in order to give the players and spectators an opportunity to sleep off the effects on Sunday. The dance must be held close to the river to enable the players to go to water during the night, but the exact spot selected is always a matter of uncertainty up to the last moment excepting with a chosen few. If this were not the case, a spy from the other settlement might endeavor to ensure the defeat of the party by strewing along their trail a soup made of the hamstrings of rabbits, which would have the effect of rendering the players timorous and easily confused. The dance begins soon after the dark on the night preceding the game and lasts until daybreak. And from the time they eat supper before the dance until after the game on the following afternoon, no food passes the lips of the players. Mr. Mooney selected for illustrations the last game which he witnessed on the reservation in September 1889. On the occasion, 
and questioned that young men of Yellow Hill were to contend against those of Raventown, about 10 miles farther up the river, and as the latter place was a large settlement noted for its adherence to the old traditions, a spirited game was expected. Each party holds a dance, plate, and its own settlement, the game taking place about midway between. The Yellow Hill men were to have their dance up the river, about a half mile from my house. The spot selected for the dance was a narrow strip of gravely bottom where the mountain came close down to the water's edge. Several fires were burning. Around the larger fire were the dancers. The men stripped as for the game with their ball sticks in their hands and the firelight playing upon their naked bodies. The ball play dance is participated in by both sexes, but differs considerably from any other of the dances of the tribe being a dual affair throughout the dancers are the players of the morrow with seven women representing the seven Cherokee clan. The men dance in a circle around the fire, chanting responses to the sound of a rattle carried by another performer, who circles around on the outside, while the women stand in line a few feet away and dance to and fro, now advancing a few steps towards the men, then wheeling and dancing away from them, but all the while keeping time to the sound of the drum and chanting the, the refrain to the ball songs made by the drummer who is seated on the ground on the side farthest from the fire. The rattle is a gourd fitted with a handle and filled with small pebbles, while the drum resembles a small keg with the head of a groundhog leather. The drum is partly filled with water, the head being also moistened to improve the tone and is beaten with a single stick. Men and women dance separately throughout the music, the evolutions and the songs being entirely distinct, but all combined to produce an harmonious whole. The women are relieved at intervals by others who take their places, but the men dance in the same narrow circle the whole night long, excepting during the frequent halts for the purpose of going to water. At one side of the fire are set up two forked poles supporting a third laid horizontally upon which the ball sticks are crossed in pairs until the dance begins. As already mentioned, small pieces from the wing of the bat are sometimes tied to these poles and also to the rattle used in the dance to ensure success in the contest. The skins of several bats and swift darting insectivores birds were formerly wrapped up in pieces of deer skin together with the cloth and beads used in the conjuring ceremonies later on and hung from the frame during the dance. On finally dressing the game at the ball ground, the players took the feathers from the skins to fasten in their hair or upon the ball sticks to ensure swiftness and accuracy in their movements. Sometimes also hairs from the whiskers of the bat are twisted into the netting of the ball sticks. The players are all stripped and painted with feathers in their hair, just as they appear in the game. When all is ready, an attendant takes down the ball sticks from the frame, throwing them over his arms in the same fashion, and walking around the circle gives to each man his own. Then the rattler, taking his instrument in his hand, begins to trot around on the outside of the circle, uttering a sharp hi, to which the players respond to with a quick hi hi, while slowly moving around the circle with their ball sticks held tightly in front of their breast. Then with a quicker movement, the song changes to Ehu, and the responses to Ha-hi, Ehu, Ha-hi, Ehu, Ha-hi. Then with a prolonged shake of the rattle, it changes again to ahi The dancers responding with the same word, ahi but in a higher key. The movements become more lively and the chorus louder to let a given signal with the rattle the players clap their ball sticks together and facing around go through the motions of picking up and tossing an imaginary ball. Finally, with a grand rush, they dance up close to the women and the first part of the performance ends with a loud, prolonged hoo-hoo from the whole crowd. In the meantime, the women have taken position in a line a few feet away with their backs turned to the men while in front of them the drummer is seated on the ground but with his back turned toward them and the rest of the dancers 
After a few preliminary taps on the drum, he begins a slow, measured beat and strikes up one of the dance refrains, which the women take up in chorus. This is repeated a number of times until all are in harmony with the tune. When he begins to improve choosing words, which will harmonize with the measure of the chorus and at the same time appropriate the subject of the dance. As this requires a ready wit in addition to ability as a singer, the selection of a drummer is a matter of considerable importance and that functionary is held in correspondent estimation. He sings of the game on the morrow of the fine things to be won by the men of his party, of the joy which they will be received by their friends on their return from the field and of the disappointment and defeat of their rivals. Throughout it, all the women keep up the same minor refrain, like an instrumental accompaniment to vocal music as Cherokee songs are always in the minor key. They have a plaintive effect even when the sentiment is cheerful or even boisterous and are calculated to excite the mirth of one who understands the language. This impression is heightened by the appearance of the dancers themselves, for the women shuffle solemnly back and forth all night long without ever a smile upon their faces, while the occasional laughter of men seems have subdued. The monotonous repetition, too, is sometimes intolerable to anyone but an Indian. The same words to the same tune being sometimes sung over and over again for a half hour or more although the singer improves as he proceeds many of the expressions have now become stereotype and are used at almost every ball play dance according to cherokee myth the animals once challenged the birds to a great ball play the wager was accepted the preliminaries were arranged and at last the contestants assembled at the appointed spot The animals on the ground, while the birds took position in the treetops to await the throwing up of the ball. On the side of the animals were the bear, whose ponderous weight bore down on all of position, the deer who ex excelled all others in running, and the terrapin, who was invulnerable to the stoutest blows. On the side of the birds were the eagle, the hawk, and the great Klaniwa, all noted for their swiftness and power of flight while the latter were preening their feathers and watching every motion of their adversaries below, they noticed two small creatures hardly larger than mice climbing up the tree in which was perched the leader of the birds. Finally, they reached the top and hum humbly asked the captain to allow to join in the game. The captain looked at them in a moment and seeing that they were four-footed, asked them why they did not go to the animals where they properly belonged. The little things explained that they had done so, but had been laughed at and rejected on account of their diminutive size. Oh, they were judging and judging these these animals were being just in how they looked. On hearing their story, the bird's captain was disposed to take pity on them. But there was one serious difficulty in the way how could they join the birds when they had no wings? The eagle, the hawk, and the rest now crowded around. And after some discussion, it was decided to try and make wings for the little fellows. But how to do it? All at once, by a happy inspiration, one bethought himself of the drum, which was to be used in the dance. The head was made of groundhog leather, and perhaps a corner could be cut off and utilized for wings. No sooner suggested than done. Two pieces of leather taken from the drum head were cut into shape and attached to the legs of one of the small animals, and thus originated Tlamiha, the bat. You hear that? The bat. That's how the bat came about. The ball was now tossed up, and the bat was told to catch it, and his expertness in dodging the circling about, keeping the ball constantly in motion and never allowing it to fall to the ground, soon convinced the birds that they had gained a most valuable ally. They next turned their attention to the other little creature, and now behold a worse difficulty. All their leather had been used in making wings for the bat, and there was no time to send for more. In this dilemma, it was suggested that perhaps wings might be made by stretching out the skin of the animal itself. 
So two large birds seized him from opposing sides with their strong bills and by tugging and pulling at his fur for several minutes succeeded in stretching the skin between the fore and hind feet until at last the thing was done and there was Tewa, the flying squirrel. You hear that? That's how the flying squirrel came about in this mythology. Then the bird captain to try him threw up the ball when the flying squirrel with a graceful bound sprang off the limb and catching it in his teeth carried it through the air to another treetop a hundred feet away. When all was ready, the game began. But at the very outset, the flying squirrel caught the ball and carried it up the tree, then threw it up to the birds, who kept it in the air for some time. When it dropped, but just before it reached the ground, the bat seized it, and by his dodging and doubling, kept it out of the way of even the swiftest of the animals until he finally threw it in the goal and thus won the victory for the birds. Because of their assistance on this occasion, the ball player invokes the aid of the bat and the flying squirrel and ties a small piece of the bat's wings to his ball stick or fastens it to the frame on which the sticks are hung during the dance. All right, so that was a great story, great mythology, uh, an explanation for the bat and the flying squirrel, and it had something to do with the game or sport, right? Continuing, at a certain stage of the dance, a man, specially selected for the purpose, leaves the groups of spectators around the fire and retires a short distance into the darkness in the direction of the rival settlement. Then standing with his face still turned in the same direction, he raises his hand to his mouth and utters four yells, the last prolonged into his peculiar quaver. He is answered by the players with a chorus of yells, or rather yelps, for the Indian yell resembles nothing else so much as the bark of a puppy. Then he comes running back until he passes the circle of dancers when he halts and shouts out a single word, which may be translated, they are already beaten. Another chorus of gels greets this announcement. This man is called the Talala, or woodpecker, on account of his peculiar gel, which is considered to resemble the sound made by a woodpecker tapping on a dead tree trunk. According to the Orthodox Cherokee belief, this gel is heard by the rival players in the other settlement who, it will be remembered, are having a ball dance of their own at the same time and so terrifies them that they lose all heart for the game. The fact that both sides alike have a talala in no way interferes with the theory. Sounds like they have their little pep type of pep rallies, right? At frequent intervals, during the night, all the players accompanied by the shaman and his assistant leave the dance and go down to a retired spot at the river's bank where they perform the mystic rite known as going to the water, hereafter to be described. While the players are performing this ceremony, the women with the drummers continue the dance in chorus. The dance is kept up without intermission and almost without change until daybreak. At the final dance, green pine tops are thrown upon the fire so as to produce a thick smoke which em envelops the dancers. Some mystic properties are ascribed to this, pine smoke, but what they are, I have not yet learned. Although the ceremony seems to be intended as an exorcism, the same thing being done at other dances when there has recently been a death in the settlement. At sunrise, the players dress now in their ordinary clothes, but carrying their ball sticks in their hands, start for the ball ground accompanied by the shamans and their assistants. The place selected for the game being always about midway between the two rival settlements was in this case several miles above the dance of ground and on the opposite side of the river. On the march, each party makes four several halts when each player again goes to water separately with the shaman. This occupies considerable time so that it is usually afternoon before the two parties meet on the ball ground. While the shaman is busy with his mysteries in the laurel bushes down by the water's edge, the other players, sitting by the side of the trail, spend the time twisting extra strings for their ball sticks, adjusting their feather ornaments, and discussing the coming game. In former times, the player during these halts was not allowed to sit upon a log, a stone, or anything but the ground itself. Neither was it permissible to lean against anything except in the back of another player 
on penalty of defeat in the game with the additional risk of being bitten by a rattlesnake. This rule is now disregarded and it is doubtful if any but the older men are aware that it ever existed. On coming up from the water after the fourth halt, the principal shaman assembles the players around him and delivers an animated harangue, exhorting them to do their utmost in the coming contest, telling them that they will undoubtedly be victorious. As the omens are all favorable, picturing to their delighted vision the stakes to be won and the ovation awaiting them from their friends after the game, and finally assuring them in the mystic terms of the formulas that their adversaries will be driven through the four gaps into the gloomy shadows of the darkening land where they will perish forever from the remembrance, the address delivered in rapid jerky tones like the speech of an auctioneer has a very inspiring effect upon the hearers and is frequently interrupted by a burst of exultant yells from the players at the end with another chorus of yells, they again take up the march. On arriving in sight of the ball ground, the Talala again comes to the front and announces their approach with four loud yells, ending with a long quaver. As on the previous night at the dance, the players respond with another yell and then turn off to a convenient sheltered place by the river to make the final preparations. The shaman then marks off a small space upon the ground to represent the ball field and taking it in his hand, a small bundle of sharpened stakes about a foot in length addresses each man in turn, telling him the position which he is to occupy in the field at the tossing up of the ball after the first inning and driving down his stake to represent each player until he has a diagram of the whole field spread upon the ground. The players then strip for the ordeal of scratching. This painful operation is performed by an assistant, in this case by an old man named Standing Water. The instrument of torture is called a kanuga and resembles a short comb with seven teeth, seven being also a sacred number, with the Cherokees. The teeth are made of sharpened splinters from the leg bone of a turkey and are fixed in a frame made from the shaft of a turkey quill in such a manner that by a slight pressure of the thumb they can be pushed out to the length of a small tag. Why the bone and feather of the turkey should be selected I have not yet learned, but there is undoubtedly an Indian reason for the choice. The players having stripped the operator begins by seizing the arm of a player with one hand while holding the kanuga in the other and plunges the team into the flesh at the shoulder, bringing the instrument down with a steady pressure to the elbow, leaving seven white lines which become red a moment later as the blood starts to surface. He now plunges the kanuga in again at another place near the shoulder and again brings it down to the elbow. Again and again the operation is repeated until the victim's arm is scratched in 28 lines above the elbow. It will be noticed that 28 is a combination of four and seven, the two sacred numbers of the Cherokee. The operator then makes the same number of scratches in the same manner on the arm below the elbow. Next to the other arm is treated in the same way. Then each leg, both above and below the knee, and finally an X is scratched across the breast of the sufferer. The upper ends are joined by another stroke from shoulder to shoulder, and a similar pattern is scratched upon his back. By this time, the blood is tickling a in the little streams from nearly 300 gashes. None of the scratches are deep, but they are unquestionably very painful, as all agree who have undergone the operation. Nevertheless, the young men endure the ordeal willingly and almost cheerfully, regarding it as a necessary part of the ritual to secure success in the game in order to secure a picture of one young fellow under the operation I stood with my camera so near that I could distinctly hear the teeth tear through the flesh at every scratch with a rasping sound that sent a shudder through me. Yet he never flinched, although several times he shivered with cold as the chill autumn wind blew upon his naked body. The scratching is common in Cherokee medical practice and is variously performed with a brier, 
a rattlesnake's tooth, a flint, or even a piece of broken glass. It was noted by Adair as early as 1775 to cause the blood to flow more freely. The young men sometimes scraped it off with chips as it oozes out. The shaman then gives to each player a small piece of root to which he has imparted magic properties by the recital of certain secret formulas. Various roots are used according to the whim of the shaman, their virtue dependent entirely upon the ceremony of consecration. The men chew these roots and spit out the juice over their limbs and bodies, rubbing it well into the scratches, then going down to the water, plunge in and wash off the blood, after which they come out and dress themselves for the game. 